All right, thank you everyone for coming. Um, yeah. Or Charlie. So uh, my name is Charlie Kimball. I know many of you, many of you I haven't met yet, um, and I hope to at some point. Um, but I have been volunteered, or I volunteered to be the moderator because I think this is such an important issue for Woodstock. Um, and tonight, this is a forum to really get information from the Woodstock Aqueduct Company about the status of the water system, what their financial positions are, or position is, and what the outlook is for it. So it's informational. Uh, we are going to be taking questions at the end. Uh, and I know it's going to be really hard not to ask questions as we go through, but my job as moderator is to try to put that towards the end. So there's a lot of information, a lot of what you may have questions about are going to be covered. Um, I am not an employee of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. I am just an interested citizen and have been for a long time in this particular issue. Um, and so I did volunteer to help uh, the folks at Woodstock Aqua Aqueduct Company run the meeting. Okay, so this was not going to be an official meeting of the town or the village. It was just going to be informational. However, there was such interest in the meeting that we thought we might get a quorum of the select board and also of the trustees to attend. We do have a quorum of village trustees. We do not have a quorum of select board members. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up the village trustee meeting and then then will go back to being the informational session. And at the end, the trustees will close that meeting. So it is not a time to have the trustees discussing the positive or negative of particular ideas. That could come later. We anticipate there will be other follow-up meetings to this particular meeting. Um, so whether it's the select board or the trustees, that's going to come after this meeting. So with that, Seaton. Uh, thank you, Charlie. So it is 5 on Thursday, August 31st. I'd like to call this meeting of the Woodstock Village Board of Trustees to order. We've got Jeffrey here, Gabe is here, and I'll turn it back over to you. Terrific. So it is, we are now going. Okay. So, um, so first of all, this is both in person and on Zoom. We've got about 25 people that are attending by Zoom. So we're gonna to try to manage the meeting between the people that are here and the people on camera. It is being filmed, it's being recorded. So just behave yourselves. Um, so at the end, as I said before, we're gonna take questions and opportunity for comments. We're gonna to try to limit the comments to three minutes. When we get to that section, I'll remind you of that. Uh, to make sure that everybody has a chance to say something if they want. To. Sound all right? Okay. Some housekeeping. The bathrooms are out in the hallway. If you have a phone, please turn it off or turn off the ringer. Um, microphones. We will be passing them around. Are the microphones working on Zoom? That's all right. The microphones uh, will be recording the entire time. And when you have a question at the end, we will pass the microphone around clear for you. Um, let's see, what else? As the moderator, I might be more firm than you want to cut you off. I, I apologize in advance. Um, no live chat is enabled for this meeting, consistent with the select board practices. So they may be able to contact the presenter, in this case, Tess Malloy, uh, so that we can clarify if the audio is working or anything else. But So there's no live chat going on right now. And let's see, the people on Zoom are on mute. Uh, and we will unmute them when they have a question. And then we'll alternate to go back and forth between audience members that are here and people that are on Zoom. OK, so any questions right now about the format of the meeting? Excellent. You can follow those instructions well. All right. So with that, I'd like to bring up uh, some of the members here. So first is Jira Billings. Jira is the majority as the manager president of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. And how many generations now? Three or four, four uh, generation of the Billings family uh, in the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Craig Jewett, uh, professional engineer. He's uh, one of the principals at Otter Creek Engineering. Uh, Craig is very knowledgeable, not only about the Woodstock Aqueduct Company system, the water system, but also water systems throughout the state. Tom Debevoy, where's Tom? We're gonna make you come up. Uh, Tom is a minor shareholder. He has two shares in the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Um, 
but uh, also a longtime dairy farmer, but also former chair of the select board in Woodstock and a local historian of some uh, note. Yes? Yes. Uh, that's what your wife told me I could say. Um, I should stop there. Yeah. Uh, and Tess Malloy, who stepped in, Tess Malloy uh, here to the right, uh, is stepped in as the communications person for the Woodstock Aqueduct Company uh, after the July rain. So you should have received a lot of notes from Tess. Great job. Uh, so Tess is being... Also with us is Arthur with the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. You might have seen Arthur out uh, making a lot of the repairs along the way um, so we could recover from the July rains. Uh, with that, I think we can sit down. Okay. Is that right? Yes. All right. So before I turn it over, before we go, can we go to the next slide? Okay, that's what we're going to cover. And I'm sorry, if you want to strain your neck, you might be able to turn your chair a little bit if you're facing this way. Uh, but that is the agenda of what we hope to cover in the next 80 minutes. We've already gone through 10 minutes. I apologize. Um, so welcome. We did that. The Aqueduct Company overview, water pressure requirements, recovery from July flooding, financial condition of Woodstock Aqueduct Company, the uh, future outlook for both the water system and the Aqueduct Company, and then we'll take the questions. All right, this is good. All right, so I do have something just to go over this. The question is, why are we here, right? Um, because it is probably the best day of the summer right now, <laughs> and we're all inside or on Zoom, so thank you very much. So it's obviously important, but the disruption of the water system because of the July rains really spurred on a lot of discussion about the Woodstock Aqueduct Company, uh, its relationship to the town, the future outlook of the company, and its and the community water system. Uh, this is not a new conversation. Uh, it has been going on since the water company was established in 1880 uh, by community-minded individuals that felt a public water system was necessary to support the growing town. So the town has been happy to let the Woodstock Aqueduct Company uh, address the water needs of its users without really interfering. Uh, meanwhile, the owners of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company have long felt like the town should take the system off its hands. And so it has operated for 143 years like that. So, but the situation is different now. Right? Tonight, you will learn details about how the water system works. Many of you may think you know, and you'll be surprised at how it actually works. Um, and then the challenges it faces, the requirements of the state, and expectations of the customers and finances of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company and its future outlook. So some of you may also think it's unique for a public, for a, a wa private water system to serve a public need. It's not true. So in Vermont, there are 1,831 public drinking systems, water drinking systems. Of that, there are 480 public community water systems that serve communities like this. And of those, there are 244 that are privately owned. That's data that I think you helped me get. Yes, right. So it is not unique. Now Woodstock is the largest among those in terms of the public water systems, but it is not the only one. So that's important to note. Okay, so the details on the board founded in 1880, it is a private for-profit corporation and tonight, the company is going to share with you their financials. Um, and not every private company does that. Uh, that's not publicly traded. So that's unique. Uh, so there are 35 shareholders and really five employees. There's two regulatory bodies they have to report to, which makes it really tough for any company. One is the Public Utilities Commission and the other is the Agency of Natural Resources. So it's not just one on quality, it's the other on, well, rates. If any utility, you have to get approval for rates. 777 connections, both residential and commercial. So and there are obviously larger users. Some are very large. The Woodstock Resort Company is a large user. So is the school system. So is the trailer park. So is 506 on the green. So we can go down through all of those different uh, interested people. And then there are 96 fire hydrants. So that are supported supplied by the Woodstock Aqueduct Company water. All right, okay. So let's go to the next slide, because I think 
This is where I stop talking and Craig Jewett starts speaking. Now, my job is to keep Craig on task. Good luck. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm going to stand. I, uh, I'm an active talker, and I don't want to hit Charlie while, while I'm sitting down. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Craig Jewett um, with Otter Creek Engineering. Um, if we go back to the previous slide just for a second, I wanted to point out something that is unique uh, to the aqueduct company, not as water systems as a whole, but for typical water systems. So um, for neighboring municipal water systems, uh, town of Hartford, for example, um, because they're a municipally controlled system and they're not owned by a private company, the Public Utility Commission does not regulate or uh, have any say over that town setting its rates. So when we get into the conversations about capital and about rate setting, there is an entity involved in that conversation that is not typically involved for the majority of public water systems, public community water systems in the state. Um, the Public Utility Commission does regulate privately owned public water systems, but their main role is to um, control rates and capitals related to other utilities that you might think of, electric, um, power, telephone, uh, those, those sorts of entities. So for the aqueduct, that is a unique um, data point in this conversation that there is an extra layer of regulatory oversight and regulatory control that does not exist for a majority of systems of similar size. Um, so we can go back to the next slide. So a little bit about the water system as a whole, and we'll go through this very generically. Um, the colors may be a little hard to read, but we'll kind of go down the line. So the, the, the pink line that you see are for two inch diameter lines or smaller. Um, in your house, you typically probably have a, have a Ooh, yeah, it does, it does yeah. actually, uh, have a three quarter inch uh, water surface. So a, a two inch water line, although it's called a main is tantamount to a water service in a lot of cases. Um, the blue shown is four inch water mains. Uh, this, the red is six inch water mains, green being eight, and the blue or cyan is 12 inch. Um, of note, typically uh, fire hydrants are only allowed on eight inch water mains or larger. So if we were designing a brand new water system, those four inch lines wouldn't be allowed to have hydrants on them or would need to be larger in order to have hydrants on. Um, generally speaking, you have the wells, uh, the water sources on the north end of the site along Route 12. Um, there's three active wells, uh, currently one gravel well, two drilled wells. And on the far west side of the system on Cox District Road, you'll see the water storage tank. And you may ask yourself, well, why was the water storage tank on the other side of the system? That's originally where the original water source uh, for the water system was, was the reservoir. Um, and at the time that storage was necessary, the reservoir was the water source. So the tank was next to the source at the time. What has happened since and transpired over time is actually the sources have switched over to groundwater sources, uh, much safer, uh, better water quality, uh, less variability as far as uh, quality. Um, and what that means is, is the sources and the tank, the water storage tank floats on the system. So for a typical water system, you would want the source, the tank, then distribution to your customers. So when the wells are active in the system, they're actually serving two purposes. They're meeting the demand in the water system while trying to fill the water storage tank at the same time. So they have they, they compete against each other to a certain degree related to how the water system operates. During the day, those wells are needed to supply a lot of the demand in the village. When, when the demand starts to drop off, that's when the wells are filling the water storage tank. So it is a little bit of an atypical setup and that's simply because of how this developed over time. Um, so, one of the things that we'll be discussing tonight, it's not a new subject. It's been a subject related to this water system for about as long as this water system has been around. It ebbs and flows as far as criticality and importance, 
but essentially the state of Vermont for water systems that provide fire protection have a minimum standard of flow and pressure that any public water system meets if it provides fire protection. So there are water systems, public water systems that do not have fire hydrants. They don't have this same requirement, but for all water systems, public water systems that have fire suppression as part of what they provide, there are minimum standards, uh, stand, uh, minimum pressure and volume that need to be met. And for, for those purposes, it's 500 gallons a minute while maintaining 20 PSI of pressure throughout the system. So a fire hydrant needs to get turned on for a fire event. The system needs to be able to provide 500 gallons a minute to that fire hydrant while maintaining 20 PSI worth of pressure in the rest of the system. And what that is trying to do is prevent a negative pressure situation where something could enter the water system because there's a pressure differential. So while it, it is a, a public safety, it is also a public health issue. They're, they're kind of balanced from that standpoint. Um, every water system in, the, in Vermont that has fire suppression needs to meet this minimum standard. This is the minimum standard that the state has set. Uh, anybody who knows anything about firefighting, 500 gallons a minute sounds like a lot of water. It's not a lot of water. Um, typically, in a village of this size, you'd want to see somewhere in the neighborhood of fire hydrants that could do 2,000 gallons a minute, 1,000 gallons a minute. So this is just the minimum standard that the state sets, not from a public safety standpoint, but from a public health standpoint, that these are the minimum conditions that the water system needs to meet to maintain public health. Um, so the aqueduct has made improvements over time to try to address this. Like I said, this is not a new topic. Uh, this is a topic that has, has been going on, um, hydraulically for the entire time the system has, has happened publicly and regulatorily. It's been the last 10 or 15 years that it's, uh, really become more of a focus, uh, from a regulatory standpoint. Um, one of the things, uh, in, in addition to the investments that the aqueduct has made in the system, is we were hired uh, to conduct a preliminary engineering study to identify potential alternatives to address these deficiencies from a fire suppression standpoint on the system. So what might the system need to do to be able to maintain that 500 gallons a minute at a minimum pressure of 20 PSI anywhere in the system? Those alternatives include a new tank site, um, select water main replacement, or a combination of those in, in various ways, shape, and form. I'm going to redirect you a little bit. How does the current system match up to the state requirements? So as of, as of now, the way the system operates is the wells are run somewhere in between 16 to 18 hours a day on average. <clears throat> when the wells are running, the water system uh, has approximately 24 to 26, and I apologize, I don't know the exact number, fire hydrants that cannot get 500 gallons a minute without dropping the pressure. Now, that becomes even greater when the wells are off. When the wells are off and the wells are not supplying flow into the system, nearly all of the fire hydrants fall below that standard. Um, so it, it is a, a concern uh, related to this. It's it's as much a public safety concern as it is a public health concern. Um, anybody who's familiar with the history of Woodstock knows that that's not the original Woodstock Inn. Um, there, that, that is an example of the water system not being able to provide enough water to be able to fight fires like that. And that is the balance that needs to be gauged. It's a public safety and a public health, but they need to, they, they're not independent of each other. Um, just a note on the study and the alternatives that we are talking through, we're roughly at about a 60% uh, stage with that report. We've met with the state on two occasions to review the progress of the report and discuss the alternatives that we are further um, sussing out through this process. Um, we do it, that that sounds confusing, 60%. Again, moderator privilege. Granted, okay. <laughs> That sounds confusing, but isn't it typical that a study that's done of this nature is at that percentage when you have a public meeting like this? 
yes. So, um, little inside baseball. Uh, apologize for for boring everybody for a moment. When the state helps fund some of these water, or when when these water systems do studies like this, the state wants to see it at incremental points as it's being developed. They don't want to see it at the end and not like what they see. They they play a role in the process and what they they call that is a 30, 60, 90 review. So they want to see it at about a 30%, about a 60%, and right before you're ready to kind of put the put the final I's and uh, T's uh, on the report. So we're we're more than halfway through. Uh, I would anticipate we'd be finishing and getting towards that end, hopefully before Thanksgiving. Great. Next point. Uh, oh, just go back to the slide. I did miss that. So um, one thing uh, related to these alternatives, the, the associated investments that would be necessary for that, we anticipate a range of about three to seven years before that would be necessary. And that includes time to design the project, time to uh, review with potential landowners about where tank sites might be, that sort of thing. So it, it's not that, that the aqueduct wants to wait that long necessarily. That's how long a typical process for this would take, uh, would take uh, in this scenario. Um, so wanted to just kind of go through uh, the July flooding because I, I know uh, that's a, a lot of how this kind of got generated as quickly as it did. So um, as you all know, in July, we, we saw some pretty significant rain and the damage done to the water system was related to the two crossings of the Ataquichi River. Uh, there's, a, there's a river crossing that goes across Billings Farms and there is a second river crossing that goes along the Elm Street Bridge. Um, during the rains, uh, there was enough flooding damage that the, those pipes became exposed and those then became damaged so that they could not actually uh, maintain pressure uh, related to that. So with the way this system is set up with the sources on one side of the river and the tank on the other side, uh, that became a really critical issue really quickly because maintaining the levels of the storage tank were down to a four inch line that goes along uh, River Street, a uh, very, very small diameter line. So went from 12 inches and an eight inch crossing to down to four inches to try to supply the storage tank to keep it full while also trying to get the water system uh, back up and running. Um, as you all have heard, there was there was some. It took some time uh, to to get that system back online, and it was really because those parts and pieces needed to be coordinated a with the state. The, the aqueduct could not just go out and start putting stuff back together immediately, uh, but also uh, a conversation of how that might get done. What what was the critical and more likely fix um, and really Billings Farm was fixed first. That, that actually was the easier of the two to deal with. There was some temporary work that was done to Elm Street, which I'm sure uh, uh, made, made the papers related to some current concerns that were brought up. Um, and that, that was really done to try to get the water flowing as quickly as possible, not from a potable standpoint, but again, from a public safety standpoint, the, the public safety component that the water system supplies to the town and to the village. Um, happy to say that both crossings are back online and the Elm Street crossing is uh, moving forward with a permanent fix, um, which would be a 12 inch main hung on the bottom uh, of the bridge. So it would no longer be in the, in the river, it'll be uh, actually suspended from the bottom of the Elm Street bridge. But what about the river crossing at Billings? How did you fix that? So the river crossing at Billings was fixed uh, via directional drill. Uh, so essentially come back probably about three, 400 feet, maybe 500 feet from the river and directionally bore a pipe under the river and come up on the other side. So you could tie in on both sides. I believe the final depth that we ended up across the river was about 12 to 14, 15 feet. 15 feet. <clears throat> so the idea was to try to get that pipe as far down below that riverbed as possible so that if and when, and probably more likely when than if, this happens again, that pipe is better protected from something like this happening. And do you have a timeline about the crossing on the Elm Street Bridge? 
I don't because uh, unfortunately, I, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, I'm not needed uh, for that. That's more of a structural engineering question of hanging that on the bridge and the improvements that the bridge might need to make that work to have that extra weight on it, including the loads for the bridge. The size of the pipe has already been known or has already been determined. That would really be my only involvement in it. So it's really a a structural uh, conversation at this point and dealing with the improvements that would be needed to the bridge, basically hangers, and to confirm that the added weight to the bridge would not substantially impact or adversely affect the bridge. I met with a contractor today about the Elm Street Bridge, and it looks like we're gonna have quotes on all the components, the structural engineering and the other parts by the middle of next week. Sure. Thank you. So oh, next, this is where we talk about the financial condition of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. We're going to look at some numbers, uh, their profit and loss statement, the balance sheet, uh, and then what is the capability, what is the ability of the aqueduct company to make additional investments right now in the water system and going forward? And then we'll talk about the Vondell property. Okay, let's go on to the next one. This is a very cursory view in terms of how big is this company? Well, if you look at the top line revenue, uh, so you see five years there, these uh, year ending 1231, you know, the biggest year within that is $514,000. And that's all revenue that's paid to the company from water rates, from logging, from things paid by the town, that's inclusive of everything. So the operating income is then after all expenses or all your operating expenses are taken out, what are you netting in for income at that point? So you can see it's all over the map, and it really depends on what happens during the year in terms of repairs. That's why the repairs are broken out on the bottom line uh, to show some of that. And there's some variability in some of the rates that are being paid, depending on what's going on at the time, or there could be logging in one year, and there could be something else in another year. Um, and then also the loan payments on the bottom. Uh, it shows you what the aqueduct company has had to pay to different lenders, uh, for the debt that they've had to incur to make improvements to the system. So we'll go over the uh, balance or the balance sheet next. But that's very a very cursory view. Um, we didn't want to get into the details of the financials, thinking that that is a separate meeting. If you're thinking about, well, what's the capacity? Show me on a cash flow basis. What can the Woodstock Aqueduct, Aqueduct Company support in terms of a bond? Well, that's a very detailed discussion we have to get to later there are certain expenses you can add back in uh, to help carry some debt service. What is the rate capacity? All those kind of things. So we didn't want to go in through that detail just to give you a snapshot of what is the operating income statement like. And, you know, I thought these guys were going to vacation in Tahiti all the time. It's just not happening. Okay. So let's go on to the next one uh, then, the balance sheet. Now, this is a snapshot in time of what the company's assets, liabilities, and equity is. And this is as of 12-31-2022. So you can see what the cash, the other uh, other current assets are in terms of there's, I think, $70,000 in uh, uncollected rates from the previous quarter, that kind of stuff. So that's all within there. So that's $175,000 in current assets, usually collectible within 12 months or current. And then the net property plan equipment is $860,000. So we're talking about the Vondel Reservoir and then some pieces of equipment and then piping and other kinds of inventory. So that's what the assets of the company are. So the liabilities, normal operating liabilities, 26 grand, long-term debt, 673,000. So we're talking about three different loans uh, for the company. The biggest one is with Vermont Economic Development Authority. Uh, that is the state's public lending authority. Uh, then you also have a private loan to a local bank and then also an equipment loan. So those are the three components of the debt that is out there in that particular point. And then other is something that confuses me, so we shouldn't go over that. So total liabilities is 772. Um, and then the, what is the common stock? Common stock is the original capital or other capital contributed by the stockholders of the corporation. So you're talking about $100,000. If you're talking $1880, remember it was found then, that was a lot of money. So, and the retained earnings then is $163,000 after 143 years of operations. So that is a very high level view of what the financials are. 
And again, we can talk about some of the, that in the question and answer uh, if you have specific questions or if it's something that we need to go into at a separate meeting. Okay, we all right? Okay. So here's the issue. Um, so the Vondell Reservoir, does people know where that is? Okay, so the Vondell Reservoir is the aqueduct. It's at the top of Cox District Road. If you're a mountain biker, you know where the uh, aqueduct trails are. Well, they go around the reservoir. Uh, and it's a 357 acre parcel of property with a large aqueduct there. I'm not sure how much it holds. Any idea? A lot of water. 30 million. 100 million gallons? 30 million. 30 million gallons, 30 million gallons of water. So that was the original water source for the aqueduct company. Uh, also, I think that also includes the uh, reservoir on Cox District Road. Cox is 12 million. Cox District Road is 12 million gallons. So if you go up Cox District Road where the storage tank is on the left, then you come upon a pond on the left, that is another holding tank, another reservoir, if you will, uh, that's also on that. So that's, we're really talking about the assets. The question for the Woodstock Aqueduct Company is, what's your balance sheet look like to be able to take on additional debt to borrow money to fund the improvements that are necessary. So it's also regulated by the Public Utilities Commission as to how strong the, the company is. So if they feel like the company is over leveraged, meaning they've got too much debt to service from the cash flow, they're going to say, no, no more borrowing. Are you there yet? Yeah. Yes. OK. So the Woodstock Aqueduct Company has been really told by the Public Utilities Mission, Commission you have maximized how much you can borrow based on the value of your assets. So that is the question is how much can they then borrow? The cash flow, as it stands right now, also won't support, you saw the financials, uh, won't support additional debt. So then the question is uh, other sources of money to fund capital improvements, you're talking grants, and you're talking low interest loans. I think the state revolving fund is what percentage? 2%. 2%. But if you go out to current market rates, you're at 6 or 7%. It makes a big difference on a large loan. So they're also not eligible for a lot of the federal grants that are coming down into different places. For instance, Killington just received a $2.2 .2 million grant from the Northern Borders Regional Commission to help with their water system. So the Woodstock Aqueduct Company is not eligible for that type of funding, all right? So as a private company, they're not eligible for that. Sure. So I think I covered that. Yes, go. I just like to point out that the debt uh, has nothing to do with uh, the uh, directors going to Tahiti. Oh yes, I forgot about that. Yeah, forgot that part. Uh, what the Aqueduct Company has done for years is pick up an improvement project that was at the top of the list and and do it and and mortgage the Vondell property in order to pay that improvement and then pay off the debt like most of us do hopefully uh, and until they're to a point where they can borrow again against the collateral of the Vondell property to do the next project that's on the list. So it's not, uh, um, it's not a question of, um, you know, going behind every year. There's, you know, there's separate operating type loan for that. Um, the vast majority of that debt has to do with things the aqueduct company has done over time to improve the system. And the best example of what we're talking about is, is the most current example is the West End line. Um, the West End line um, comes down the back side of the river. And uh, we have Eric Wegner with us tonight, who was with me for many years running the company. And we built that line on uh, financed against the Vondell. And we're in the process of paying that loan down now to move to the next one. Okay. Let's go on to the next slide. So what's next? Craig was talking about the improvements that have to be made to the system in order to increase that water pressure to satisfy the state's requirements for water pressure. So that's one particular piece. Uh, and there are options that they have identified 
um, and to consider to help increase the water pressure so it's sufficient to meet either all or part of that deficiency as it is. Each one has a price tag. Uh, each one can start at a million dollars. Now, I'm looking at a capital improvement project over the next 10 to 20 years, that's what we're really talking about. What does that look like? Not only just immediately solving that particular need, but what are the additional needs going to be? So, and that's what part of the questions that we don't have the answers to right now is, what does that capital improvement plan look like? Because that's not in writing anywhere that I know of over the next, it's not. It's not. But really it's just meeting the most immediate need, which is right now is the water pressure. So uh, uh, Craig in his report, which again, was at 60%, once working with the state, once that gets closer to being done, because the state has to say, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, then that will then again be shared with the public uh, when it's about 90% done. So then we can argue about the different merits of the different proposals in there. So if you say a certain price tag, and then the question is, how can those investments be financed? There's a couple things. So the Woodstock Aqueduct Company could go itself and try to raise outside capital, talk to individual investors, go back to the original investors. Is there the ability to raise this money? From what I understand from the company, there's no ability right now that you know of. We have not identified. Not identified. Second is that the town would then buy the aqueduct company system and then would make the improvements and fund it through normal public project financing as an alternative to that. The third is, and it's possible, that the Woodstock Aqueduct Company is then sold to an outside group of private equity investors. And that's not a scare tactic. it exists. Um, there are, according to some studies that I've read, there are 14 different public equity companies across the United States that have operations in 33 states. Um, and so it is a reality that those companies do exist and would want to buy a company like Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Um, and what is their strategy at that point? Well, it's like, ah, we've got to raise the rates a little bit. So you do lose that local control. So that's one of the options that exists for how do you raise the additional money? So those are things to be explored at the next meeting, but those, those are kind of the realities. It's really one of three things. Either the Woodstock Aqueduct Company finds the money, the, the town or municipality takes it over, or they sell it to an outside investor. There's a point that I'd like to make about my family and others in town who built the company in 1880. Uh, my great grandfather and his brother, along with several other local businessmen, went to the town in 1880 to try to get the town to make a public water system. After several attempts not being successful, they formed this privately held company. And that's how it's remained. Future generations, my, my grandfather, um, so that my great grandfather I'm talking about, my grandfather and my father, have both approached the town as I have over the years. And the reason, the main reason is, is because I know I'm not going to be here forever. And I think the most important thing is that Woodstock control its own water. That's what's the most important thing to me. And that was the most important thing to my ancestors. So we need to find a way to make sure that we keep local control. And the idea of an outside equity company or something like that coming in here would be the worst thing for all of us. Okay, we have a next slide. Okay, here's the fun part. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna take some questions. Do you have questions about the information that was presented? Uh, what more do you wanna know uh, to go forward? Some of the questions that you ask now, we might say, you know what, that's good for the next meeting. And we're gonna write all the questions down. Tess is gonna write all the questions down on a Word document and display that. And then what else needs to be considered? So we want to really, hear from you, get those questions so that we can come back to a future meeting. Uh, remember, hang on a second. Remember, uh, we're gonna try to evenly divide the, the people asking questions between those who are on Zoom and those who are in the room. We're gonna ask that you limit the length of the question or the statement that you have so that uh, you know it's reasonable, that everybody gets a chance. Uh, and let's see, just be nice. Uh, is there anything else we need to do? All right. So now, are, 
Also, if you're on Zoom, the way you raise your hand is you raise your digital hand. You go to where it says reactions at the bottom of your screen. You press that and there's a digital hand. You can then click that and that will raise your hand and bring you to the top. So that way we will know if you have a question and we will call on you alternating between those in the room and those on Zoom. Are we good? Okay, hang on. I know Susie Stoltz has a first question. We'll get to you in a second, Susie. All right. Okay, great. With that, um, we're gonna pass this microphone around. Um, before I forget, we wanna make sure, if you're interested in this topic for future meetings, make sure your name is on the uh, forms at the back. Uh, Stuart, yes, all right. Right outside the door, great. And that's, by the way, that's our town manager, Eric Duffy, standing there next to Stuart Matthews. If you haven't met Eric, please shake his hand. Thank him for getting all the roads repaired after the live <laughs> All right, great. Uh, with that, we'll open up to questions. Uh, Susie, do you have a question? Yeah, first, um, it's Susie Stoles. Stoles. Oh, yeah. sorry. So my question is, um, you said that the, the uh, Public Service Commission regulates uh, rates. Correct. So can a private equity company come in and gouge us, or are, they, the, or are the rates going to be controlled by the Public Service Commission? Good question. So uh, private equity... Hang on a second. Sorry. Did everybody hear the question? So the question just for people on Zoom, in case you didn't, is can can a private equity company then raise rates ordinary, extraordinarily high uh, because they're regulated, even if they're regulated? That's the question. Yep. So if private equity were to buy the aqueduct, that does not change the regulatory authority. The, the, um, the Public Service Commission still would have regulatory control over the rates. The reality is, is that they will have to try to get the money from somewhere to pay for the improvements. All of all of the things we're talking about here, they all rely on the users. So with, with that in mind, the users are ultimately going to pay for whatever is necessary to fix the water system. That reality doesn't change regardless of what ownership is. The issue with private equity is they don't have a historical tie. And um, although the town doesn't control the water system, you have a company that is very tied to the town and feels, as Jaira has said, that they want to do things in the best interest of the town. A uh, private equity firm, in my opinion, would want to do the best thing for their bottom line. <clears throat> Okay. Oh, and I want to make sure also that when you speak, please introduce yourself so we know who's actually talking. Thank you. And wait a minute. We have to alternate between here and Zoom. Do we have any questions on Zoom? We don't. Okay. My name is Stuart Matthews. The only point I wanted to make is that the Woodstock actually company is a for profit business, but it has been run effectively as a nonprofit organization, they have not tried to maximize their earnings. So they have they have raised rates over time, but very modestly and, and not really enough to earn a return on capital, but just enough to just barely pay back the improvements that they made in the system. That would probably not be the case where an outside investor to come in to fund the projects we're talking about. So, so one of the things that I want to know for a future meeting is how do the water rates in Woodstock compare to other municipalities in Woodstock and how do they compare to other places in general? So I, I want to know that uh, and what is reasonable to expect. So could you put that on the question board for the next time? And, and I can actually give some context to that question. Um, the revolving loan funds and USDA, which are federal organizations and state organizations that fund municipal infrastructure projects, usually look for an interest rate, or uh, sorry, a, a rate for a water system to be somewhere between one and 2%. That's what they, of mean house, of typical mean household income. So when they look at what they will give you for a funding package and how that's all structured, it's to try to keep that rate between two to 1% of mean household income for the service area. Great, thank you. And nothing on Zoom? You got a question? Well, Allison Clarkson, yes, all right. So we have Senator Clarkson, she's not here, but she is also a Woodstock resident. Uh, and uh, Allison, go ahead. Uh oh, 
We, we can't hear you yet. Uh, Allison. That, okay. There we go. Uh, now we can hear you. Yeah. So I can't, I don't know about the other Zoom people, but I am unable in this format to raise my hand digitally. So just, just, I mean, other people may be able to, but I'm not able to. So I have a couple, uh, I have a question. First question, are we built out as, is the capacity, uh, are we full to capacity in terms who we can serve at the moment? Because one of our major concerns is growing our economy in our downtown. And I understand that we have not been able to hook up some new businesses that have wanted to be hooked up. And so I guess that's my question. Are, are we at capacity right now? Is that a question we can answer today? It, it is. So um, it's not a question of capacity. It's a question of making a existing deficiency worse. So what the state of Vermont will say is essentially you have a stated deficiency in your water system, hooking on more people and creating more of a demand on the water system and opening up other individuals to this deficiency is not acceptable. So it's not that there is not enough water to serve these people, but the, the hydraulic condition of the water system limits further connection until those, those deficiencies are addressed. So Craig, would you say this is one of our chief limits to growth in Woodstock? Um, without a doubt. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, Dave DeLeon, a village trustee. I have uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, so the first You're a trustee, it's your meeting in a way. <laughs> so the first one is, uh, are there any instances of having the water system be a cooperative? And if so, would that be another option other than the three that you offered up? So that's the first question. And the second one is with, uh, uh, with regard to the limitations that we have now in the system, do we have to be concerned about the upcoming foliage season when we have a lot more people in town than we normally do? Okay, so the two questions, could a form of ownership be operative instead of the three that we gave? And the second question is, are we concerned about the water capacity for the upcoming foliage season? Right. Uh, I don't know if we can answer the cooperative question. That's something to put on the board to uh, look at for the next meeting. That's a very good question. I, I will add to that. There's kind of an intermediate and it's what they call a fire district. So the fire district would be just the service area. It is treated like a municipality from a funding standpoint. So you would be eligible for funding, but it is restricted to the user base. Um, and that can cross municipal lines. Um, the, the best example I can give you is the town of Rutland has 10 fire districts. Uh, because of how it is surrounded by the city of Rutland. So they have 10 fire districts that act as semi-municipalities. Uh, the co-op question specifically, I don't have an answer to. The other part of that, I believe the village of Waterbury water fire district or fire district. Yes. The fire district of Waterbury became essentially the village government because the village disbanded itself. Correct. Which is another avenue for the trustees to consider. <laughs> to think about. Okay. And the second. Oh, foliage. Second question is capacity for foliage coming up. So that that question goes back to the fact that this is not a new conversation. This condition has existed in the water system. There is no documented issue that I'm aware of that anyone has gotten sick or that there has ever been contamination of the water system. So the state sets a standard that is hopefully belt and suspenders. That doesn't mean if you fall below that standard that something is going to happen. You're increasing the likelihood that something will happen. So although this, ex this condition has existed pretty much for the entire time that the system has supplied fire suppression, there is no documented case that the, that the system itself has ever been contaminated. And to answer your direct question, the demand that increases from people coming in will not exacerbate that. The condition we're talking about is when a fire happens or a fire hydrant is used. And think about it very similar to a water main break, which you guys have all experienced now. That water main break decreases the pressure in the system, allows potential contaminants to come in, and we've got to make sure we put everything back together and that there's no contamination before people can start drinking it again. The fire hydrant uh, scenario is tantamount to the same thing. 
you are, for all intents and purposes, breaking a water main potentially if you pull too much water out of a hydrant and you've created potential negative pressures in parts of the system that should be concerning. But on a whole, as a regular operating condition, no, foliage would not make it any more susceptible or, or exacerbate that, uh, that condition. Thanks uh, for our answer. Back here on the right. Yep. Yep. Go ahead. I'm Amy McElroy. I live in the village. I have a question. I was um, hoping to get a little more information about the ownership of the aqueduct. I, I think the paper said that there were 10 owners and maybe today said 35, but is that information that we will um, find out about? And um, do, how are the shares, um, are they ever sold or are they just passed and given away or does anybody want them? And just general information about ownership. Yeah, just the ownership, what does it look yeah. like? And I think I'm gonna ask the member that owns two shares of the Woodstock Aquata Company to answer that question. Tom? I have no idea who owns the other shares other than members of the Billings family. <laughs> yeah. My father left me mine. I don't know where he got it. <laughs> they just showed up, you know. Basically, basically what we have is originally there were 2,000 shares issued. So those those people that, that invested back in the 1880s and 1890s um, bought all of those 2,000, and that's all that exists today. Those families all then inherited the stock down. And so it's quite like a genealogy tree. It just goes out and fingers from those families. Mostly not, there's hardly any, or I don't think there's anybody that owns more than 12% of the company. And I, I'll just add, when, in terms of buying or selling, it's not a publicly traded stock. I mean, find out who one of the, the other, or maybe put it on the list, sir, I don't know. On the other hand, um, Trying to remember the last time the company paid a dividend. Um, One dollar a share. I remember that yeah, part that's... for the year, not yeah. quarterly. <laughs> Do you know whether all of the um, owners want to sell? I know that they would. Uh, I guess, in the words of my father, because he used to go through this with the town many times, was make us an offer. That's and I and I think that as I stated, we, our family wants this comp this water system to be controlled by this town, and it, we will do everything we can to see that it goes that direction. But you know, we also have financial issues that we have to work out. So we're hoping that we can work with the town government and educate all the people as we're trying tonight, and have other future meetings of this group and others that we can get to join in and help us reach a decision of what is the best way to take this company forward. Thank Great, thank you. John. Yes, um, another shout out to Tess. She did an outstanding job. I thought she was running the place. And I really, I really appreciate all your emails. So another shout out there. Um, I believe the, the you know, John King, I'm from Woodstock. I live on Watkins Way. Um, I do believe that the water company should be owned by the town. I think it's very important for raising money, getting bonds. Um, so um, my question would be, I would want to know uh, what the value of that, what we think we, it's worth anything, if anything, if it's $1, $10, $100, uh, we want to make sure that it's at the right price if it's, if it's just a gift. Number two, uh, we've, uh, we've talked about the capacity. Um, we need to build more housing. Uh, we need to grow our economy. Um, taxes provide for a civilized nation, right? Right here, we need a better water system. We need to be able to build more in strategic places, the East End. We will not be able to develop those properties unless we have town water there because they've been contaminated. No, no commercial loans will go on there because it was contaminated at one time and you can't put aqueducts in there. So that's really, really important is um, the potential income of new taxes is really important. I built two buildings, small, small uh, input, $80,000 in new tax revenue. That's really important. So my question is, uh, that has to be tied to growth. How can we grow and where, how we can get water to those places? So you have the two questions, what is it worth? What does that purchase look Correct. like? And then the second is about how do we support more growth within the community? <laughs> on the Correct, water? and for, you can project potential tax revenue based on those, those projections and where it's gonna be developed. That's really important. 
because we have a lot of other infrastructures that we need to do. So it also keeps taxes down. So I think it's really important. So uh, thank you for having this forum. Okay, and I think the, the first question would really be a follow-up meeting is like, what does a financial model look like? Uh, uh, the second question is capacity. It's a really good question as to is, is it maxed out now? And uh, I think Senator Clarkson brought up the fact, is it, are we already maxed out or uh, stultifying, if you want to use that word, it's a weird word, but stultifying development because we don't have additional capacity. We've got some developers in the room, such as yourself, that would say, yes, this is cutting down development. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if that's a matter of, matter of fixing the pipes first. And the second is then ultimate capacity of the water source. From a company standpoint, the town, the company would love to work with a committee of the of the townspeople, of the townspeople and the town government, whatever the select board and the trustees thought was the right um, path for us to take. But we would love to study the value and all of those issues together. Great. We have a question from Roger. Uh, any online test? Hang on, hang on. Okay. There's a microphone behind you. Hi, um, Roger Logan. Woodstock Village and Town, I guess. Um, I think we need to be very, very clear that if we are following the precedent that was set when we were discussing financing of sewage improvements, that when we say the town owns it, that may well be the case, but unless something is going to change drastically from the previous, the previous conversations, 700 to 800 people are going to be financially responsible for the bond to purchase the system, the bonds for improving the system, and anything going forward. So we need to be very clear that when we're talking about the town owning something, and we're talking about the entire town voting on bonds, that then only a very a, a small subset or a, a third or so of the town is responsible for paying. So I think we need to be very clear on what the kind of financial burden that's going to be placed over and above other kinds of taxation and other kinds of infrastructure that this that this town and village need. So I, I'm not expecting anybody to be able to answer that question right now, like but I think we need to be very clear about which which was not in fact the case when the bond was put out for the sewer. We need to be very clear that while the town is accepting responsibility for this, the payers are going to be a subset of the town. Right. So we need to be very clear on that going forward. Yeah, and that's uh, subject to future debates for sure. Who pays for it? Tom has a perspective on the original sewer bond, I believe. Sorry. I, I do, and I think Charlie's right. I mean, this uh, will need to be worked out later. But the way a special district, a fire district, um, Jeff and I both remember discussion the last time the merger came up to talk about a police district. <laughs> Those types of districts um, do not have borrowing authority on their own. So the bonds have to be um, put out and done by the municipality. In this case, in this discussion, it would be the town. The select board actually has their, uh, the select board, they're also the board of sewer commissioners. And that goes back long enough ago, so I was probably still in high school, <laughs> the late 60s or, uh, or very early 70s, when the main plant was built. And there was a big discussion then um, as to how that would be funded. So the sewer district was set up and the town put out a bond, and there was a committee form, which was chaired by uh, Dr. Jim Roberts, who is a veterinarian. Uh, and the discussion went on, and that bond um, was passed, and, um, and the way the bond was paid for was actually split, because just as there is today, there was advantage to everyone in the town in, in, in many ways. Um, but there were also many people out in the town who were putting in their own septic system. And, and you know, unfortunately for some, 
uh, mound systems who said, well, you know, I, I, well, that long ago, today I would say, you know, 50 grand for a mound system. Um, and they were saying, well, no one's helping me pay for the mound system. So why are my taxes going up to provide sewage capacity for other owners? And in the end, there was a compromise. And for years, um, and I forget how long the bond was, I know we were still paying it when I was on the select board in the late 80s. Um, and your tax bill would come and there would be a line for municipal taxes, the municipal tax rate, and a line for the school tax rate. And then there were two lines and every property fell into one of the two categories. There was a line for sewer users and a line for sewer non-users. And I can't tell you what the percentage breakdown was, but people who were not users did help pay off that first bond. Um, so again, this would be, a, you know, depending on how things work out, if, if there is a discussion with the town taking over the system, because a lot of the users are not in the village, um, uh, if that discussion happened, one of the topics I'm sure would be, well, what percentage of the bond is going to be paid you know, strictly by you or by the town as a whole. And one of the good reasons for that is a lot of the improvements the state are looking for have to do with the fire department. I mean, if we didn't have 90 odd um, hydrants, the state wouldn't have a problem with our water pressure. But um, no one on the board of the aqueduct company, at least, has suggested, you know, doing away with, <laughs> with the fire hydrants which may be a private equity firm work, I don't know. Anyway, I'm just, what you raise a legitimate point, but um, but what, what you said is not necessarily going to happen the way you think it might. But it'd be, I'm sure, very fervent debate. Yes. Uh, yes, Eddie, English. <laughs> I'm Edwin English, and I live in uh, West Woodstock. And I just feel that if the town takes over this um, water system, that it is, well, a third of the town is going to vote these bonds in, and the rest of them, it won't you can fill in the blanks and that's my question is if if the town takes it over at a town meeting you won't get the number of people voting for it and against it it's a very good question you raise, Eddie. There's three basic questions that I see within this. If the town wanted to take it over, one, does the town people want to? Two, can the, how, is the town ready to pay for it in some way? Who pays for it? And the third is, can the town do a good job managing it? So it's, it's those three questions that really have to be answered. Uh, to your point is that that has to be a very public discussion about does the town want to do this? Um, Thank you for that. That is a good question. I, like, just um, can we put on the? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what to talk into here. So it's listening to you. Okay. Um, can we put on for the one of the agendas and how we? Uh, you know, um, last year we voted on an uh, options tax to pay for a one percent options tax to pay for infrastructure problems, uh, things like this. It lost by nine votes. But there's no reason to say that we can't vote for that again. And we, so we don't have to necessarily pay for this out of our own pockets. I mean, it is possible to have an options tax vote, collect money on that, and use that to pay for the bond. So if we can put that on the agenda as a topic, that would be great. Thanks. Great. Yes, you got that? Yeah. So using the su suggestion was to put on for future consideration, looking at the options tax. Right now, it is on rooms, meals, and alcohol, but there is no tax on sales. Um, so it would be an additional tax on sales, and that would go towards infrastructure improvements. 
and, and just to add into that as well, the context of that also de depends on ownership of the system from an interest rate standpoint. So the town going out and getting financing for improvements versus the aqueduct is a significant difference in just interest rates, let alone uh, the possibility of subsidies and other things like that. Can you give that right? Um, so I, I would say right now, if you were to go try to finance this, you're probably looking at six, 7% interest uh, on, on a, you know, even just say a million dollars versus uh, the town's ability to go to the state of Vermont or to uh, USDA rural development and get a low interest loan. Right, as a different funding source. Yeah, yeah. yeah. as a different funding source. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? We have one in the back. Yep. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Kathy Washburn, and um, my question or something to be put on for another agenda is the advantages of becoming a municipal, having this become part of the hum the municipality. You had mentioned Killington got um, two million dollars. Like, are there other advantages where the onus is not all on on like what you were just saying, the percentage of interest rate, could we get other, a list of the advantages of what it would be to be part of the municipal? That's fair enough, right. Uh, so what are the other advantages of being a municipally owned water system? And, and anecdotally, I can kind of give you a couple of examples of that. We can talk about it further more. Um, something was mentioned about a capital improvement plan, a, a larger plan. Um, there are grants available to municipal sewer or municipal water systems right now to do an asset management plan, which develops the capital improvement plan uh, up to $50,000, which would more than cover doing that for this particular water system. If the town owned that, that's a 0% interest loan uh, that would uh, be completely forgiven once the project was done. If the aqueduct was to do that, that is uh, financed money. Uh, with with no subsidy, and so that's a small example of a lot of different things that we could go into in greater detail. So that um, so thank you for that, and we'll definitely look at other financing options as if uh, as if, are there more open to municipal ownership. I would just add that the most recent example that I know of is the town of Arlington in 2016 was a water company, and the town bought it from the privately owned water company. It was substantially, it was a lot of money. It was a big bond and they have a smaller user base than does Woodstock. Um, but they have gone successfully now and operated it for seven years. Uh, and so there is a lesson from them and we can learn from them. So that one of the questions is what have other municipalities in Vermont done? What's been the benefit? What's been the cost? So we can learn that from them. Yeah, okay. Hang on, Roger, we'll come back to you. Go ahead, Charlie. Um, everyone, speak up. Oh, sorry, Charlotte um, Hollingsworth, and I live in the village. I just wanted to thank the Aqueduct Company. Ever, we've been here 20 years, and um, I've always thought your rates were very reasonable, and I, I appreciate really everything that you've done. And if the town were to take over the water company, could there be a stipulation? that the members of the aqueduct board be on, uh, I don't know if it's a committee or a position or what to, because they know the water and um, whereas maybe someone else on the, you know, in the government would not, could there be something like that? Good I, I would be very happy to serve on any board for any okay. length of time. That's and, and I think members of my operations team would be very useful to this process as well. Thank you. Great, thank you, Charlotte. Are there any questions online? Do we have any? Oh, okay. oh I'll, please, I'll. Oh, yes, we have Senator Clarkson. Permission to speak a second time? Is that what you're asking for, Alice? Uh, indeed, Allison Clarkson, Gulf Avenue resident. Uh, <clears throat> we still have some aqueduct water that is flowing freely from the hill. Um, at, uh, at Mount Peg, uh, I, I would just love to remind myself what the water source is. Is it, is the, uh, water storage tank, 
uh, fed by springs, by the solely by the what is the reservoir fed by, and is the aquifer is are the ground are the wells fed by the aquifer or the or just groundwater? So the the current sources of the water system are uh, two drilled wells, similar to what some of you may have at your home. Um, and a larger uh, well that's called a, a gravel pack well. Um, and that pulls directly out of the groundwater aquifer directly below it. Um, I don't have specifics on yields of those wells, but the, the system is solely served by groundwater sources. Uh, the reservoir no longer uh, serves the source of the system. It could be used for emergency purposes if necessary but the, the system is solely served by groundwater sources. So just to clarify that a little further, basically the water goes from the wells through the system to the tank. So we took the, when we built the tank in the eighties, we took the reservoirs off the system and it, it, there's been no surface water in the system since then. So that was one of the questions that I asked the aqueduct company and also uh, Craig in preparation for the meeting is that, well, why can't we just use the reservoir? It seems like a good source. And the response was, well, yeah, sure. But you could have to put in a treatment plant that would cost about four to $5 million in order to process the surface water to make it potable. And the state frowns up upon uh, trying to get any kind of surface water to be potable. Is that accurate? I wouldn't say frown frowns upon frown upon it. It, it. You have the ability to do it. It is much more advantageous to have groundwater sources. They are safer, more secure sources. Uh, they are less apt for contamination um, and those sorts of things. So, if you had a choice between the two, you go with groundwater um, every time. And and has the aqueduct company ever looked for other sources of water at time? We we've dropped many holes exploring different areas of, and we've not found anything that's suitable yet. But there's still a hope out there that somebody will come up with a better spot. Just want to point out that Eric Wigner's giggling over that. Okay. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> he drilled a lot of holes. <laughs> 65 test wells. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to go with Seth and then Laura has the microphone. Uh, so she's got a baby too. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Laura Powell. I live here in the village. Um, I just had two questions that probably may be answered tonight. Um, but as they relate to public health and public safety, I'm wondering, um, firstly about the pressure of the fire hydrant system, if there's anything we can do in the interim while we're working up to what the state's regulations are so that if there is a heartbreaking fire in town, like the system and the users don't suffer and we don't suffer catastrophic damage. My second question is, I'm wondering ownership discussion, notwithstanding what the company is doing in the meantime to stay on top of state policy as it relates to uh, state standards and contamination. There were a few days uh, after the floods where uh, you know there was this possibility that the water wasn't drinkable and we weren't told till after the you know, after the fact. Um, and so I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, while it's still privately owned um, and, and maybe that was asked and answered. I, I apologize, I showed up late. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so I'm gonna ask Craig to be brief on this because you could go on for a long time. Uh, do you wanna take the water quality first? Sure, so uh, there is an interim policy that has been developed and it's in conjunction with the fire department. So if the fire department needs to hook on to a hydrant, uh, there is a, an agreement that they will let the aqueduct, uh, they will make the aqueduct aware of that, and the aqueduct will treat that as a water main break on the system so that it would go under uh, a boiled water notice until water quality samples can be taken uh, in sufficient numbers to prove that there is not contamination in the system. So that's an interim policy that's gone in place. The state has reviewed that. The state has actually approved that. That's one of the first water systems they've ever actually approved that for. Uh, but they understand that the aqueduct can't snap its fingers and fix this problem. It is it is going to take uh, some time to do so. So everyone felt that this interim policy and thankfully the fire department being, being a willing partner um, can prevent something like that from happening if there were a fire 
uh, that resulted in the need uh, for the, the water system to be used. Good. The, the other question was, uh, in case there is a fire, right? Mm -hmm. Or is that the question you just answered? But because there was a question about the potability, the drinkability of the water, and I think that was related to PFAS. I didn't want to bring that up, but I think that's that what you're talking about. Yep, and that's where I was trying to get you to be brief. Yep, and, and, and I, I will try to be brief with that. So um, the, the policy is, is that the system should go on an immediate boil water notice and all of the users be notified either uh, via mail, via the town, uh, whatever means necessary. We, we live in an age where there's multiple different ways to receive that information. Um, so the aqueduct is um, has, has multiple means of making sure that the public does do that. And there are procedures in place from the state to make sure that that notice goes out in a timely fashion. Um, immediacy is not necessarily a possibility in a lot of cases because it is a large group of people to kind of make aware of that. But there are policies in place to make sure that that information gets to the public as quickly as possible. Thank you. We're going to go Seth and Roger right behind her. Yeah. My name is Seth Westbrook. I'm a co-founder and board member of the Woodstock Area Mountain Bike Association. We manage uh, 30 miles of trails uh, throughout the community, 10 miles of which are on the Aqueduct property, the Vondell property. And I just want to point out that the company provides an important community resource for trails and recreation. Um, so I just would want that to be noted and considered moving forward that it's it's an important part of the community fabric uh, and much appreciated. And I'll add to that, that we were, we're so happy to have the recreational use of the Bundell. And I would hope very much that whatever happens to the aqueduct, that this land could become a recreational area that's available to all the public, including the Mountain Bike um, Association, who's done a lot of work up there and we appreciate it. Great. Uh, Thank you. Can I just add to that? Um, Thank you very much but our trails are also open to walkers they're not just for riding bikes so it's dog walking whoever wants to you know be up there unless your dog barks at bikes um i just i charlie brought it up and i think you charlie brought it up um i think one of the things that we need to consider are well there's two things we need to consider one as you said the the capacity of the town to take on this this management system. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of people up there who know a hell of a lot more about hydraulics than I probably anybody in this town, and we need to understand that. And also the governance, whether or not, like the sewer, that the select board becomes the water commissioners, or we can come up with some kind of different modality um, that would include some of the intelligence that's been developed over generations. So. I guess a question would be, this is all very complicated stuff, the finances, the tech, the, the governance, the management, how much can we slow walk this before, are, are we, you said three to seven years, a project to essentially deal with the, the capacity issues between the hydrants and, and then also potentially adding additional capacity as, as more residences or businesses come online. So. Are we talking about five? Could we get away with a five-year time frame? Could we get away with a two-year time frame? And I know, you know, that that's a difficult question. I wouldn't expect it to be graven in stone, but but this town and people who use the water have a lot of things to work out, um, and it's going to take a lot more than one meeting, obviously. So, so I guess from a technical standpoint, how much time do we have before some of these issues become potentially not necessarily catastrophic, but but depressing on on the local community. So, as far as impact to the community, um, I, I am aware that there are businesses that have requested to be hooked up to the aqueduct that have been unable to. So that situation exists right now. Um, as as far as 
question about how long you could slow play this or understanding that one has a lot of things to consider and a lot of plates that are spinning all at once. Um, from a technical standpoint, if we were given the go ahead, it would take us a year, maybe two to develop a project, assuming that we had landowners who cooperate as far as tank sites and, and such like that. Um, from a technical standpoint, that's not really the governor on this conversation. The governor on this conversation is the financial component of that because we can design this and move that forward. At some point in time, the rubber is going to meet the road and somebody's going to have to pay for those improvements. And that's that's where that conversation starts to slow way down. Because to Jaira's point, going out and trying to raise capital for what those improvements may in, entail and what they would need to do um, is not really possible with their financial outlook the way it stands right now. So I guess, I guess what my question was, was not how, I mean, it's not like you can do this project for two years. How long could you wait before having? I, I would say without the official endorsement of anybody here that uh, the can has been kicked down the road pretty consistently, and there's great interest in solving the problem without kicking it further down the road. So there's a sense of urgency from the state to actually get a decision made. And I think I could say that even from the filings of the Public Utilities Commission, which are a public record, um, you can see some of the messages in there saying, what are you gonna, what are you guys doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? But from the company standpoint, we've been working towards this meeting for a year. If this didn't happen because of the flood, this meeting, we've been collecting data and having a small group of people that are close to me meeting to try to figure out how to bring the, the public into this discussion so that we can make the best decisions because we want the town governance, but we also want the town people helping us figure this out. And and, and I'll add to that. So uh, it, adding on to the state starting to put pressure on um over the last year and a half or so, there have been discussions about painting fire hydrants black and welding them shut. Um, I, I see Butch is in the room, and I, you know, I, I personally would never advocate for that under any circumstance. Uh, a public safety concern, um, in my mind, uh, that may cause a public health risk can be managed rather than having somebody die from a fire or having property loss. So again, it becomes a balancing act. And really what it is, is how best can we manage it now, knowing that the long-term solution is not going to be turn of the key. Okay, so I just, we have a time check. We have five minutes left. So we're gonna take just a couple more questions over here on the left. Uh, and then we're gonna start with Seton, who is the chair of the Village Trustees. Hi, I'm Seton. I live in the Village. Um, I had a couple of just clarifying questions and, I'll, and some of it's because I don't understand the full history. So I've, I've heard a lot about like deferred maintenance. There's been a lot of things that need to be fixed. There's concerns from the state. Um, there's upgrades that need to be done. And then I'm also hearing the, we've known for a while that there needs to be more maintenance. And we've known for a while that, that there, needs, there needs to be an infusion of cash, obviously, to be able to do all of these things. So as somebody who's relatively new to town, when have those proposals been made or have proposals been made to the town? Has has the aqueduct come to the select board or come to the town manager or come to anybody in the town and said, we would like to sell to you, here's our proposal? Has that been happening? Is, is that like, and have there been barriers in the past that you need to get past no matter what the, the path is? So then, uh, Seton, may I just clarify, has Please. there been any formal approach? Yes, so if the, if the, if the if part of the concern is always knowing that you wanted to to sell it to whomever have those proposals been made so that we can go back and see okay this is why the town decided not to move forward 10 years ago or 20 years ago are those proposals out there and have you just figured out what's changed since then or what you need to change in your proposal or what the town needs to change we haven't ever been given we've talked to the town government behind the scenes and we've never been given a chance to even get to the point until now and we a year ago or more we started planning okay we, we need to bring the public into this because if we're not able to do it through the town management there's got to be more people finding out and we didn't do that in the past and i'm sorry to clarify so you're saying that the town would not let you make a proposal in the past 
the it was brought up to the town government numerous times over the past just just as it was from the beginning that, that and we never got to the point where we could do what we're doing tonight but perhaps you know in hindsight we could have energized this group 10 years ago or more okay so there was blockage from the town is that what you're saying i'm, I'm just trying to figure out like a proposal was made and somebody said no a governing board uh, said no negative um um never got off the ground yes yeah. okay 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 thank you all right so you had a question question okay and the other i just want to say one more point i live in the town i've lived in town for about three and a half years her name please Carolyn, I'm Carolyn. I'm living town. I have come from a country that turned over its water to private ownership. And I can tell you, if nobody is aware of what's going on back home in England, the sewer, they, they just dump sewage into the open water system. I am very much aware of how, how private owners take care of water systems. And I've watched it many, many years. So you might want to hold off on private ownership to try and seek maybe a cooperative, but that's another one down the road, and I have a lot of experience in that. So, okay, thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. And we have a bunch you, you had something, and then I think you might be the last one, Jeffrey, unless we want to go over 90 minutes, which I promise to get you out in 90 minutes because it's still nice outside. All right. Um, is it brief, Brett? Yeah, it's very brief. Okay. It's more of information than it is brief. Uh, former fire chief retired, but I don't know that we've ever had a fire in the town or the village of Woodstock that that building burned to the ground because we didn't have enough water. With the help of Eric and some of the other, uh, the Woodstock Aqueduct Company, we've developed other sources of water in case of a fire. And those are called dry hydrants. We have several of them because we have the Kedron that runs directly through our village. We're very fortunate when the block burned Two, three years ago, downtown across from the old fire station, they they draw, drew water from the aqueduct company and two different, I mean, from the Kidron in two different sources. So the fire department is very well equipped to provide water in case of a fire. They have all kinds of training and equipment to do that. Great. Thank you, Butch. So then, uh, Jeffrey, you're going to be the very last. All right, wait a minute. All right, go ahead. Oh, do we have a mic? Here you go. Great, thank so you. So this is a quick question that's more immediate than most of this discussion tonight. How long are we looking at uh, before the Elm Street correction is is done? Will that happen before next summer's potential flood? We're hoping to get this going. As I said, we should have the estimates next week. I have a contractor lined up, ready to go. So as soon as we get the structural engineering done, we can uh, move for it. And that's our plan is to do it, hopefully not in the middle of foliage, but if that's what it ends up being, that's what it ends up being. So this fall. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, you have spent 90 minutes inside on a beautiful evening. So um, the follow-up to this, we've written down a lot of questions uh, and we don't have a lot of them answered. The next is, is probably going to be meetings. We were talking about when is the next meeting logically to happen? Well, foliage is coming fast upon us. So we thought November. If there's interest, uh, we will circulate to whoever's on the email list as to what's going on, what's being considered, and opportunities to participate or additional questions that you have. Um, this has been recorded. We will make the recording available. Um, so if you're on that list, and you want to live through this again, God help you, uh, then you can do that as well. And Tess has put our email, our office email up on the screen. And so please email the office. Great. If you have questions, concerns, or if you just want to talk about it. Great. Oh, that's right. Yes. And any, uh, if you're, if it's anything other than to say, I'd like to see you guys, can it wait? Oh, maybe. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm one of them that don't have able to be on email. I've got to have a... Okay. But you know where to find us, and you just come on by. <laughs> okay. Good point. If you don't have email, what do you do? 
I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, for future meetings. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair. A motion to adjourn meeting. Is there a second? second? All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, one and all. Thank you.